In the past couple of years, we've seen a dramatic increase in reports of burning around the world from the Arctic Circle to the tropics. And it's raising the alarm on what is really one of the defining environmental issues of our time, the future of our forests. So I'm Adam Magendie, a senior editor for Bloomberg Green. And to help lead us through this complex topic, we're pleased to invite Carter Roberts, president of the WWF in the US. Carter, thank you for joining the Bloomberg Green Festival. Uh, thanks, Adam. It's great to be here. So I'd like to start with a look at the patient. What is the state of health of our global forests right now? Well, I, I, uh, I think all you have to do is uh, look at the, uh, the pictures and the news feeds today from California with um, uh, orange skies in San Francisco, evidence of the fires that are burning there, a reminder of the fires that have burned in Brazil and Australia and consuming many other parts of the world. And, uh, and you know that forests are at risk. We are seeing forests decline, particularly in the tropics, at a uh, astounding rate, something akin to 20 soccer fields every minute. And, um, and we've lost about a billion acres uh, since 1990. And, um, and that's uh, due to a number of, uh, of, of causes. One is climate change, which causes forests to, um, to change in their composition. Uh, unsustainable food production is probably the leading cause. Uh, the development of infrastructure as countries want to develop and bring products to market, markets to people. And, um, and then uh, last but not least, just um, uh, the lack of valuing of forests, and particularly by certain governments around the world who now seek to cut down forests and exploit them as part of restarting their economy. So forests very much at risk, and, um, and we, we valued forests historically because they're storehouses of nature. But we increasingly see just how profoundly they are and how profoundly important they are to you and me and the rest of humanity. So, so to take that point, I mean, before we get into the question of how do we stop all of this degradation, um, just to just set out, why does this matter? Why is it so important to, to stop losing so much of this particular ecosystem? I mean, given that, say, for example, it gets replaced by um, like other trees, uh, palm oil trees, or it gets replaced by crops or something like that. What, is, what are we losing? Yeah, when you, when you cut down an intact, rich tropical forest and replace it with a commodity monoculture, you lose a glittering array of life, the species with whom we share this planet, particularly tropical forests. You often lose other services that forests provide. The forests around the world sequester seven times what humanity emits in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. It sequesters that carbon, and every time we cut down trees, we release it. And so they are one of the biggest engines of stabilizing climate change and attack forests. Forests also provide 70% of the water that people use on the planet. And just as one example, uh, the Amazon is the main weather engine for South America. As the rain comes off of the Atlantic, drops uh, into the Amazon, evaporates, repeats, 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 hits the Andes, turns south, it provides water to the second largest breadbasket in the world. You turn off that engine and you severely cripple Brazil's economy and the provision of food to the world. And, and then um, there is um, the connection between forests, intact forests, and the spillover of zoonotic diseases. When we dig deep into a forest, we provide the conditions for bats to transmit disease Oh, uh, I'll, let, uh, I'll stop. Yeah. Just before we get to that, um, I wanted to ask about the question that the, the, the issue that you raised about uh, the development issue. You, 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 some of the reasons that you've given for the destruction of these forests is a lot of it is obviously to do with um, countries wanting to develop, seeing 
a short term gain that they can get from doing this. Um, come talk a little bit uh, about what we can do, what companies and governments can do uh, to mitigate that, to find ways where they don't have to tear down the forests or burn down the forests in order to get that sort of development. Right. Um, we we know there is this there is an economic imperative in every government. In governments, uh, they can provide food uh, for their people and also for export markets by shifting the new production of food to degraded land, to the renewing of soils in land that's already been cut down, uh, to plant new crops there. Governments can be much smarter in how they design infrastructure. So they can draw a line on the map in a way that keeps the richest standing forests intact and still provides the means to bring food to market. Governments can also, um, uh, governments can also condition the, the growth of food on food being uh, deforestation free. And let me come to the flip side, which is companies around the world can condition their purchasing of products from that government or from that locale by ensuring that it's either market certified using FSC certification or ensuring that those products were grown without cutting down trees. And that's proven to be a powerful mechanism to governments in keeping their forests intact while growing food or while building infrastructure in whatever way they do. So, so what's the role? I mean, how, how can the public help in this? I mean, the social media has become an incredibly powerful tool in the past few years, able to exert uh, an, an extraordinary amount of pressure on politicians, on governments, on companies. What, what's, what's your advice to people out there? Right now, let's go out, let's do something to stop this destruction. Uh, people can do a number of things. They can choose what they eat, and they can choose what they buy. And they can prefer products that are either FSC certified, or they can prefer products from companies that place strict restrictions on their supply chains. People can also choose to elect politicians, uh, one over another. And they can signal the importance of conservation for all the reasons we've already talked about, to their families, to their communities, to their economies. Um, last but not least, people can choose what they do in their workplace. Businesses, governments, universities, and in, in every family, there are choices that you make in terms of policies, signals that you send, requirements that you put in place and how you conduct your business that recognizes the value of nature. People are powerful in this equation and they need to make their voices heard. I've always said we need to bring the movement back to the environmental movement, which has become so mainstream. So, I mean, that brings us to the point that I think you were getting to, which was um, this, one of the things that the, the current pandemic has shown us is how how very closely related the, the, the events of nature are, and in particular, how rapidly something that happens in one part of the world can spread to affect us all. Um, what is the, how, how can we help to prevent this, this kind of uh, pandemic, this kind of virus in future through the use of uh, the way we manage the forests? How is that contributing to this? If you read the history of all the great plagues through time, inevitably the history recounts how people identified the root cause of that plague and did something about it. To date, I would argue we have spent more time addressing the symptoms of this plague and uh, addressing those symptoms, but we haven't done enough to get to the root cause, which is this. It is the spillover of disease from bats to livestock to people. And the, 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 when you track that back, this, the, the chain looks like this. When you dig deeper into a wild forest, the bats interact with livestock 
they pass on diseases which they carry in great abundance to livestock. They pass that on to people who are now um, in, inserting themselves into those wild places. And in some cases, people bring those wild animals from those wild places to market. We can address that by keeping these forests intact and ensuring that that intersection, those edges are, are less profuse. We can also address zoonotic disease at its source by ending the trade and illegal trade in wild animals and ending the consumption of wildlife that's very much at risk for people uh, because of the disease they carry. So, I mean, part of it is obviously ending that trade. Part of it is is providing the providing the environments, providing the ecosystems in which they can live, so that, that that we're not basically having to interact all the time. That's right. And you know, WWF, we have a major program in the world working with governments to keep uh, those tropical forests intact that are at the epicenter of many of the biggest diseases that affect humanity. And we are very much getting after the trade in wildlife with the help of a number of companies, many key governments, and working closely with China on ending the consumption of wild animals in their wet markets, and with great hopes that that, that policy right now becomes permanent. So um, going, coming back to the point about um, the development, what happens uh, persuading com countries like China to adopt these sorts of policies, um, and also the countries that uh, that contain some of our largest forests, you know, they, there's there's always been this argument that you know it comes back to the point about development, is that yes we would love to do this we would love to do all of these things, but um, but we need to, you know, we have poverty, we need to bring people out of poverty, we need to provide these solutions. What is the, what is the best way of finding a way to work together with, these, with the governments, with the companies and so forth, to try and bring solutions which bring development, but at the same time recognize the, the true value of the forests, especially the tropical forests around the, the equatorial area? We cannot put a bubble over all of these places in the world. Humanity and these places are intertwined in various ways. But there is always a better way to grow food. There's a better way to design infrastructure. There's a better way to handle transportation. And there's a better way to ensure that people's needs are met over the long term uh, without relying on handouts from around the world. And the evidence is in that the better forms of food production use one-tenth as much land energy and water. The best forms of infrastructure keep uh, those natural processes intact. And the best forms of transportation do the same. And so for us, it's all a question of getting upstream with decision makers, with the right science, but also with the right incentives, market incentives, so that they both understand the benefits of choosing a dam that lets water flow through, choosing food production that's more sustainable, and the market supports that choice by favoring that country and those products over others. Do you see that happening in a, in a, in a meaningful way at the moment? Do you see that, that market change where market forces themselves, uh, people's choices, the individuals themselves, are forcing um, the, the uh, particularly developing nations who rely on these commodities to, to start adapting, to start changing the way they're doing things, because it's, it makes economic sense to do so. We see it. We don't see it enough. And uh, when you... When you look at the case of the Amazon, the Amazon uh, for the past 25 years has been one of the best case studies of how market forces combined with government actions can reduce deforestation substantially. That is until recently. 
And we've seen it when um, companies enacted a soy moratorium in the Amazon and basically said, we will not buy soy uh, from this place without um, there being assurance that they, it is de-free or deforestation free. We saw it, uh, we see it now as companies, some of the biggest retailers in the world, some of the biggest um, consumer products companies have insisted that their purchasing from Brazil is conditioned on, on those things. But at the same time, um, you, you cannot underestimate the importance of regulation. There is inevitably a moment where companies will say, I've set these goals, but I can't get there without the government doing its part, either in creating parts or enacting regulations, enforcing those regulations to keep illegal deforestation from happening. And so um, consumers and companies can get us, um, let's call it halfway there, but they can't close the gap without governments playing their role. And consumers and companies can definitely influence government by making their voices heard and by being forthright about the science and the consequences for humanity. I'd like to end with one point looking ahead to what might be seen as a, a potentially uh, titanic clash between the, the, the environmental goals that you've been talking about and what a lot of people have been talking about warning the, the idea that we may be fading, facing a food crisis. Um, a lot of the, the, the destruction of these forests is due to producing agricultural products. Do you see that there is a, a, a coming conflict between those two things as the world struggles to find more food, uh, but at the same time wants to preserve these uh, important ecosystems? I believe that the future wars of the world will be fought over natural resources and food. And um, as humanity's numbers grow, as climate change makes it much harder to predict the production of food and with droughts and uh, wildfires and the rest making things more and more difficult, the pressure is on to cut down trees, to plant crops, to feed humanity. And I, I do believe um, that food is the nexus of environmental destruction and climate change, and ultimately the destabilization of the planet. So I agree with you. Um, food is going to be a, a flashpoint and we need the world, governments, businesses, consumers to um, wake up and realize there are better, more sustainable ways to grow food that don't destroy forests, to uh, enforce market signals to make it so, and, and then um, to create the land use planning and the government management to make sure that these forests remain intact. It, it is in the absence of good governance, in the absence of valuing nature, um, we have seen food fights occur in Africa, in Guatemala, in other countries in the world and, and when that happens, governments falter, people move, and it destabilizes um, many more countries besides. So this is one of the biggest issues that we face, one of the biggest reasons why WWF has built a significant food practice, because we see it, as you see it, as a, a pending calamitous issue for humanity, but even more so for the nature upon which we depend. Garda, thank you very much for joining us in the Bloomberg Green Festival. And I wish you and your organization the best of luck in all of your endeavors.